present Anthony Head reading Francis Durbridge's Paul Temple and the Kelby Affair. Scott Reed had intended to come at eleven o'clock, but he arrived at ten. His rover turned into the gravel drive as the clock above the stables was striking. The telephone call announcing his visit had sounded urgent, but then Scott Reed always left decisions until they became urgent. His office had telephoned at nine o'clock. Is that Mr. Alfred Kelby? the girl had asked. Yes, said Alfred Kelby. I have a message from Mr. Scott Reed. He is driving straight over to see you, and he expects to be there at eleven. Scott was one of the older school of publishers. He was slightly ashamed if a book sold well, and he pretended that all their bestsellers were the mistakes of his partner. Scott was a gentleman. He leaned over the back seat of his car and tenderly gathered up a packet. Then he came up to the house. Scott, come in. I was just having breakfast. Kelby waved him into the library. One alcove in the book-littered room was clear and set for breakfast. Kelby removed a pile of manuscripts from an armchair and told Scott Reed to sit down. Coffee? He asked. No thanks. Scott sat on the edge of his seat. Or perhaps I will. Yes, thanks. He was unwrapping the packet as he changed his mind. I, I want you to read this, Kelby. It's a bombshell. Scott Reed handed Alfred Kelby a diary bound in calf and written in green ink. The tiny, precisely rounded hand of a woman. Something you are going to publish? Kelby asked. Yes, Reed replied. W well, we might. I was waiting for your opinion, and it depends on whether we can get an indemnity from all the living people who are mentioned in it, to make sure they don't sue us for libel. He fidgeted slightly. What do you think? As a historian, Kelby considered that very few diaries should be published. Serializations in the Sunday papers, he complained. It starts all the amateurs dabbling in history, writing letters. Clutters up scholarship. His voice died away as he browsed through the yellowing pages. Good gracious me, who was this woman? I take it the writer was a woman. Y yes, Lord Delamore's mistress. Lord Delamore? Kelby looked pleased. I knew him. He read through a few more pages with intense fascination. This is downright scandalous. Does he have much to say about his death? It was a great mystery in his day. She says a lot about it. Perhaps you could read it through and have supper with me on Thursday. You can sign a release then. Release? Kelby looked delighted. So I'm in it then? I'm afraid so. Scott was edging his way to the door. I say, would you mind if I brought my son Ronnie? He's over from the States just now, Kelby inquired. Delighted. Now, don't lose that manuscript, for God's sake. We haven't been allowed to make a copy until the contract is signed. Kelby was protesting that copies were an historical imperative, but Scott Reed was scuttling across the lawn like a white rabbit, looking anxiously at his watch and eventually scrambling into the driving seat of the rover. He tooted twice on the horn and vanished towards Melford Cross. Alfred Kelby was a distinguished historian. He looked like a don, and in fact had been one until he found the job of teaching was interfering with his research. He was sixty-three, and had too little time left to be teaching thick-headed students. So now he was spending most of his days researching the definitive biography of Lord George. He ambled back to the alcove in the library to finish his by now cold toast and marmalade. It was early spring, and low shafts of sunlight were penetrating the dusty corners of the library. Those intimations of summer made him feel optimistic in March, usually reconciling him to the rural remoteness of Melford House. But after the briefest glance at the larch trees opposite the window, he found himself browsing again through Scott Reed's diary. Tracy Leonard, Kelby's secretary of long standing, came in. Post, she announced. There's a reply from Ted Mortimer about that loan. Kelby looked up from the diary. That means he still can't repay me. Presumably, and I'm not surprised. Will you want to see him? I'll drop round to Galloway Farm this afternoon. Tell him I'll be there about half four. Tracy had been a softly spoken and submissive girl until that afternoon when Ted Mortimer had burst into the library while they were working.
He had made a scene, shouted his accusations, and Tracy had never forgotten them. They were why Kelby hated the man when he thought about it. He rarely did think about it. He picked up the diary from the table. You look pale, said Tracy. Wouldn't it be simpler to put the whole business into the hands of a solicitor? No, that would be vindictive. He probably hasn't the money and it wouldn't help anybody to sue him. He paused. I don't have any other appointments today, do I? He smiled and made a conscious effort to be more jocular. There's only the council meeting at half-past eleven this morning, then you're free for the rest of the day. She was looking at the calf-bound diary, trying to see what it was that had been absorbing him as she'd walked in. It was sheer perversity of Kelby to pick it up and put it secretly in his briefcase. I'll read this during the meeting, he chuckled. <laughs> Far more interesting than education business. It looks like a diary, she said casually. Just something Scott Reed wants me to look at. He's thinking of publishing it. Kelby left her, feeling pleased with himself that he'd given nothing away. His simple pleasure at thwarting her even survived seeing Ronnie coming down the stairs, still in his pyjamas, this late in the morning. "'Aren't you dressed yet?' he asked automatically, but his mind was elsewhere. He would leave Tracy Leonard to squash his wasteful son. "'Don't worry, father is on the agenda.' As Kelby left the house, he could hear his son attempting his irresistible charm on the secretary. "'How romantic you make that sound, Miss Leonard. There's nothing in the post for you, Mr. Kelby. That sentence is the basis of our relationship.' "'I wasn't aware we had a relationship, Mr. Kelby.' "'You wait till I land a plum job, Miss Leonard. Then you'll be impressed. Then you'll eat your words.' I'm certain that will be the case. At the moment, you don't even receive letters acknowledging your applications, probably because you don't write any. Striding towards the garage, Kelby glanced at the sky and decided to walk. He had meant to ask Scott Reed about a job for Ronnie. Perhaps one of Scott's competitors needed a charming young man to hasten their flight into bankruptcy. But Kelby hated asking for favours. He felt relieved that the subject was postponed until Thursday, when the two men would meet again. Ronnie deserved a chance, but Kelby wondered whether the chance shouldn't have been given him ten years ago, when his mother had died. Kelby quickly pushed the past to the back of his mind. There was plenty of time to walk to the village, forty minutes, and anyway Kelby was only a co-opted member of the education subcommittee. He paused at the gate and spoke to Leo Ashwood, the gardener, handyman, even butler, who'd been attached to Melford House since Kelby had bought the place with his late wife many years previously. Leo understood about nature. It's weather like this, Leo, that reconciles me to the rural remoteness of the country. Yes, sir. Leo was not plagued by the need to express himself at any length. I like this time of year. No one ever declares war in March. No, sir. Kelby sauntered off down the lane. He wasn't really a countryman, not knowing the names of the trees or the birds in the hedgerows. He hummed happily to himself. He was a man with no problems. His musings were interrupted by an ambulance speeding towards him, klaxon sounding. It skidded to a halt on the other side of the lane. "'Is this Great Drick's Lane?' the driver shouted urgently. "'There's been a fire at the school. Looks like a bad one.' "'Good grief! Look, can I come with you?' I'm on the Board of Governors. It's, it's about half a mile down the hill. I suppose that'll be all right. Get in. Kelby clambered into the back of the ambulance. A nurse and a male attendant were already inside, and they sped away. It was a bumpy ride. Through darkened windows he could see the telegraph poles and the occasional cottages whizzing by. The school in the distance looked positively gothic, a sombre monument to the Victorian spirit of self-improvement but Kelby couldn't see any fire. That was the school, he said as they sped past. The male attendant sounded bored. Just relax, Mr. Kelby, and nobody will hurt you. Now look here. Shut up, or somebody will hurt you. <music> Darling, how are you? Steve, Paul Temple embraced his wife gratefully. I hadn't realised how much I would miss you. He shook hands with Scott Reed and sat on the back of the rover with Steve, his hand resting in hers. He knew that Scott's appearance at the dockside to welcome his ship wasn't simply a chauffeur service. He was clearly in some kind of trouble. 
After some pleasantries about his author tour of America, Paul got down to brass tacks. All right, Scott, you didn't come out here to save my petrol. What's wrong? The rover swerved momentarily. I'm worried about Alfred Kelby. The historian? Let's see, yes. Bumped into him a few times. He had a young blonde woman on his arm more often than not. Lives at Melford House in Oxfordshire. That's him. He's, well, he's disappeared. And? That's not all there is to it. He had a diary with him. Whose? I'm coming to that. About two months ago, I met a woman called Bella Spender. I was staying in the south of France with some friends, and, uh, well, we became quite friendly. Paul was growing baffled. Bella Spender? Yes, you won't have heard of her, Paul, but you should have heard of her sister, Margaret Spender. Wasn't she Lord Delamore's secretary? And his mistress? Now I remember, Paul said, Delamore was a diplomat, old Etonian, murdered soon after the news broke of those orgies in his shooting lodge. Just so, Scott Reed continued. Bella gave me the diary after Margaret was killed in an air crash a few months ago. Did the diary give any clues about Delamore's murder? Paul asked. Yes, but I don't know what credence we could give them. I was hoping Kelby could tell me how true the allegations might be. I was worried about publishing it, Paul. The diary was sensational, but it was also vicious. They were a fast-living set, I know, but I, I couldn't believe they were quite so nasty. So on, on Monday morning I drove out to Melford Cross and gave him the diary to read, and, and then he vanished. Intriguing, said Paul Temple. Most intriguing. Scott, point this thing in the direction of Oxfordshire. I think we should pay Melford Cross a visit this instant. Charlie Vosper was in charge of the case. He was at Melford House interviewing his suspects when Paul called on him. He was a copper of the old school. He knew crooks, even respected them, the ones that were good at their job, that is. If Charlie hadn't joined Scotland Yard, he could have been a successful underworld boss. Paul Temple knew him of old. They even liked each other. What do you want, Temple? Just thought you might need some help. Like I need a week in hospital. Do you know this chap, Kelby? Slightly. Then come into the library and tell me about him. Paul approved of the carved oak and the obvious solidity of the place. It indicated an old-fashioned taste for the good things in life. Kelby seems quite a wealthy man, he said, seating himself in a leather armchair by the window. He could see the chauffeur handyman on the lawn. Lived here quite a while, said Vosper. Wife died ten years ago. Son Ronnie's here on holiday from America. They don't really get on. When Paul Temple saw the young man, he could understand why. Ronnie was fair-haired and charming in an obvious, straightforward way, and his mind was totally conventional. He must have been a grave disappointment to Kelby. "'Do you think my father has been murdered?' Ronnie asked. "'It's been five days.' Vosper countered with another question. "'What did you do with yourself on Monday?' "'Monday? Oh, I got up and drifted about. "'What time?' About half past nine? And where did you drift? Around the house until lunchtime. I usually spend the morning trying to seduce Miss Leonard. She's my father's assistant. Then to the pub for lunch, followed by a round of golf. Came back to the house between four and five. Paul found himself drifting off, until Tracy Leonard came into the room, that is. She was tall and twenty-five, with straight brown hair, and wasn't going to take any rudeness from Brosper. And how did you spend last Monday, miss? he asked. I worked here all day. And when did you realise Mr. Kelby was missing? Around one, when he didn't return from the town hall. If you mean when did I really become worried, that was in the evening. Ronnie and I spent half the evening doing a tour of Melford, searching everywhere he was likely to be. And then, about ten, we went to the police. Did Ronnie Kelby share your concern? asked the inspector. Tracy Leonard smiled. I think so. He went three hours without making a pass at me. How galling for you. Have you any idea why you would have been taken by force? I assumed somebody wanted to get their hands on that diary. What diary? The diary that Scott Reed left with him on Monday morning. It seemed to be an important social document. Charlie Vosper rose slowly to his feet. You didn't tell me anything about a diary. Well, you didn't ask me. 
It was apparently rather valuable. Paul intervened tactfully to save the girl from the massive wrath of the law. Rather scandalous, actually. I should think a number of people would give a lot to have it suppressed. You knew about this, Charlie shouted. I assumed everybody knew. Charlie Vosper was turning a deep shade of mauve. Paul Temple decided to stay on at Melford to pursue his inquiries, sending Scott and Steve back to London in the Rover with a few errands on his behalf. He next went to visit Leo and Mrs Ashwood in their estate cottage, but only found the latter at home. "'Call me Gladys,' said Mrs Ashwood as Paul introduced himself. "'Do you think Mr Kelby will be all right?' "'I trust so. Only we're very fond of him, you see, Leo in particular.' Leo's your husband. Yes, Mr. Kelby always says that Leo taught him to be a countryman. They're very close. It was relaxing in the Ashwoods' kitchen. Paul was even allowed a taste of the stew Gladys was preparing for supper. This is stew like they used to make in the depths of the country, Mrs. A., he ventured. Mr. Kelby's very partial to it, sir, she paused. No, we all get on pretty well, Mr. Ronnie, Miss Leonard. Such a brilliant young girl. I don't know of anyone as would want to harm Mr. Kelby. She paused a second time. Except in Ted Mortimer. Mr. Kelby was going over there on Monday afternoon, she said, and the words registered with a sudden shock. Go on. Mr. Kelby was going over to Callaway Farm Monday afternoon. Did he ever arrive? I, I couldn't say. What was their row about? I wouldn't know, Mr. Temple, but they do say in the village there was a quarrel about money. Leo and me don't see Ted Mortar any more, you see, and as I not want to gossip. Of course you aren't, Mrs. Ashwood. Please excuse me if I dash away. He squeezed her shoulder rather affectionately. By the way, this is my card. If you do remember any gossip, please let me know. I'm a devil of a gossip myself. She was laughing as he left the kitchen, only to collide in the hall with Charlie Vosper. "'Where are you off to?' the latter asked suspiciously. "'Me? Oh, a tour of the neighbouring farms. "'It hasn't been done, has it?' "'No, Temple, it hasn't, "'and on the way you can tell me all you found out about Ted Mortimer.' "'Of course there never was such a diary, my dear. "'How could there be when Dicky never had such a mistress? "'Dicky had his faults, and I'd be the first to admit them. "'He was a bore, and he danced abominably.' I never noticed people rushing off to write in their diaries whenever Dicky trod on their corns. What did you say this woman's name was supposed to be? Steve persevered with her assignment of interviewing Lady Delamore. Margaret Spender. Never heard of her. She was your husband's secretary. The frail old lady said, Oh, like an ancient bird sighting a small field mouse. That, Miss Spender, I always felt sorry for her. She was a big girl. We called her the last of the big spenders. Her eyes sparkled with malicious life. Miss Spender kept a diary for ten years, said Steve, including the period when your husband was murdered. Killed, dear. I expect it gave her something to do in the evenings. And now that she's dead, her sister wants to publish it. How very demeaning. Steve had felt very nervous when she arrived at Delamore House, but nothing had prepared her for this. We'll have tea early today she had said pedantically. It was only ten minutes to four. Mrs. Temple looks as if she needs sustenance. She was not putting Steve at her ease. You young people are so thin these days. I'm thin, but then again I'm eighty-five. When I was your age I had a generous bosom and a bottom you could really sit on. You must have led a busy life in those. It must be too much love-making. That's what makes you thin. Fortunately, the butler arrived with the tea. It gave Steve an excuse to change the subject. She talked about the diary, but Lady Delamore's attention soon wandered again. How do you come to be involved in this? she suddenly demanded. My husband's a crime writer, and it was his publisher who acquired the diary. Crime, eh? she laughed derisively. It's a little late for solving any of the mysteries which surrounded my husband's death. Those of us who are still alive aren't likely to remember what little we knew in the first place. "'Nobody's trying to solve anything, Lady Delamore,' Steve said provocatively. "'The solutions are all given in the diary.' "'And this diary has disappeared, you say?' the old lady continued. "'A man has disappeared, Lady Delamore, the historian Alfred Kelby, "'and with him 
the diary. He was asked to authenticate some of the more prurient details concerning your husband. But the diary is incidental, she continued, although if we found that, we might also find Mr. Kelby. My husband wondered whether you or some of your friends might be being blackmailed. Whoever has this diary might try to extort money by it. I never pay blackmailers, Lady Delamore said grandly, and none of my friends has any money. I'm sorry I can't be more help. Steve helped herself to another tea cake. Alfred Kelby was reading the diary to give his opinion on its historical authenticity, she said. I don't understand. Do you mean that he could confirm that my husband was really murdered, and murdered by whomever Miss Spender accuses? Surely if Mr. Kelby knew that, he should have said so at the time, when poor Sir Philip Tranmere was arrested. Mind you, I do believe there was a Mr. Kelby up in the shooting lodge at the time of my husband's death, but I don't remember that he was really in with the best people. Anyway, what would he know about my husband? Dickie's morals were above reproach. He snored in his sleep and his feet smelled. Those are not the characteristics that attract stray women. What is more, after three whiskies, he fell straight asleep. What would he want with a mistress? I never knew a man who slept as much as Dickie. Lady Delamore had already spent the best part of a century keeping people in their place. Steve found it almost impossible to tell whether she was worried, guilty, or sublimely above the contemporary world, or just plain barking mad. Just then the butler entered. Excuse me, my lady, but Sir Philip Tranmere is on the telephone. I'll ring him back, Simpson. He says that it is most urgent, my lady. Lady Delamore sighed. Silly man. Tell him I'll ring him this evening. After the butler left, she turned to Steve. Tranmere went and got himself arrested when Dickie died. Anyway, goodbye, my dear. So sorry you must be going. Steve arrived at their muse flat to find her husband already returned from Oxfordshire. So how was Lady D? he asked. I don't think she gives a damn about anything or anybody. I hope I'm like that at eighty-five. She was so dreadful, she was rather splendid. Paul laughed. I'm sure that when you're eighty-five, you'll be absolutely appalling. Flatterer. It's nice to be home. Paul poured himself a whiskey and sat beside Steve. Would you like one? he asked. Not at the moment. Did you miss me then? I'll say I did, my darling. He kissed her cheek. Actually, I will have that whiskey. I've just spent a perfectly hideous afternoon with that old crone. So listen and sound interested while I tell you what happened. I'm all ears, Paul said, pouring her a glass. You know, I think Lady Delamore has that diary. Paul stood up in amazement. Really, Steve? You're marvellous. How do you know? She shrugged. Call it female intuition. Oh, that, Paul said. You mean you're guessing? Mind you, I suppose she would be the number one suspect for kidnapping Kelby. He paused. Oh, did I tell you? We found Kelby this afternoon. Charlie Vosper had driven like a stuntman to reach Ted Mortimer's farm, where he'd found the owner less than gracious about his request to search the premises. Go ahead if you must, but don't disturb my livestock. They aren't used to policemen. The farm was obviously run down. Ted Mortimer himself bore a grudge against the world, and his men bore a grudge against Ted Mortimer. The animals didn't give a damn for anyone. Two constables had been through the rooms and attic and cellars of the house without success. Of course, a body could have been buried in the fields, but they went through the outhouses and ramshackle cattle sheds systematically, and they found Kelby when they reached the barn. He's down there, a constable called to Paul and Vosper as they reached the gates. The rain butt by the corner. Paul and the inspector ran to the back of the barn. The rain butt was very large, and unless you were deliberately searching, you wouldn't have seen the hand resting over the edge by the drainpipe. A police ambulance and a doctor were sent for, and amid the commotion, Paul realised that the farmer was standing next to him. When did you last see Mr. Kelby alive? I saw him in the village about a week ago, but I avoided him. Why? Paul asked. Wouldn't you avoid someone if you owed him two thousand quid and were up your bloody ears in debt? Paul smiled. Good point. Did you know he was coming to see you on Monday afternoon? That stuck-up secretary of his telephone was like announcing a royal visit, but he never turned up. Were you at home Monday afternoon and evening? Yes, 
Mortimer said angrily, and I didn't see anyone putting him in the rain, but... Now, do you mind if I get some work done? I have a livelihood to earn. As Mortimer left, Vosper sidled up. He's been in the water some time, probably since Monday. Was he drowned? I don't know. I'll have to wait for the autopsy. Now, how about some tea? Good idea. Let's ask Gladys Ashwood. She's a first-class caterer. Charlie Vosper agreed. We'll have to break the news there. The son will have to make the formal identification. They drove back slowly, Paul watching the passing countryside with a new sense of strangeness. Darkness was already falling, and he found himself wondering if Kelby had died in pain. By the way, Charlie, we didn't find Kelby's briefcase, did we? No, we didn't, Charlie climbed from the car, muttering about literary bloody gentlemen and the gritty realism of police work. The lights were on in the Ashwoods' house, and Paul felt distinctly inadequate as he saw Gladys come running across the forecourt to greet their car. She stopped a few yards away and just stared. He's dead? Paul Temple put a hand on her shoulder. Let's go back inside, Mrs. Ashwood. Her husband, Leo, was standing in the kitchen doorway. Tracy Leonard was there too, but quickly melted into the background. What happened? Leo asked hoarsely. I'm afraid Mr. Calby has been murdered, Paul replied. Leo muttered, Oh, my God. It was a pretty conventional reaction, but it was genuine, like his wife's tears. Paul also heard a muffled gasp from Tracy, who was clearly listening outside the kitchen. Where did you find him? Leo demanded. In a barn on Ted Mortimer's farm. Have the police arrested the bastard? Well, no, they don't know yet who actually killed Mr. Kelby. They don't know. Leo erupted as his wife sobbed beside him. Poor Mr. Kelby. And I was just going to pick up his suit from the cleaners this afternoon. There were so many jobs to do, but there isn't any point now. Go and pick up the suit, Leo ordered gruffly. We're still working. As Paul slipped out of the house some minutes later, he found Scott Reed arriving in his black rover. He greeted him with some surprise. I came to see whether they'd found Kelby. I feel so responsible having given him that diary to read, and I promised Bella Spender a decision today. He was flapping. Has anything happened? Kelby's dead. The colour drained from Scott's face. My God, I'd better go in and offer my condolences to Tracy and Ronnie. He couldn't have foreseen that this would happen, Paul thought to himself as he set off back to London. It surely wasn't Scott's fault. Paul Temple was making notes for the book he had thought of in America. He was trying to decide whether crime and punishment was a thriller, and whether death was inherently tragic. He wanted his murder to be a gratuitous act. That would be its significance, the fact that it had no significance. But perhaps he was in danger of becoming pompous by theorising too much. Just get on and write the story, he said to himself. Can you see any reason why Kelby's death should be connected to the diary? he asked Steve. Or why he should have been killed as a result of his quarrel with Ted Mortimer? Steve nodded patiently. What's the matter? I just thought, well, why should everything be neatly tied up? He might just have been killed completely by chance by a tramp or a drink-crazed bank manager. I know this mood of yours, Paul. You talk like this when you want to write the greatest crime novel of the twentieth century. Sit down and let me get you a drink. You'll soon feel better. Kelby might have caught the handyman stealing the spoons. Ashwood. Yes, dear, he does sound like a dubious character. I'd look into Mr. Ashwood if I were you. She was trying hard to encourage him, but it didn't seem to be working. I simply wonder whether I'm being too logical. Paul sat in his desk chair and stared at his notes. Ah, the Times crossword puzzle. That would clear the mind. He sipped the coffee Steve had brought him and picked up the newspaper. Historian dead in rain butt, ran the headline. Paul read the story, then turned to the obituary, forgetting all about his intention to wrestle with the crossword. Alfred Kelby was an idiosyncratic historian whose wayward and controversial career sometimes obscured the real scholarship that lay behind his work. There was no mention of the blonde woman Paul had seen on his arm at social occasions. 
He wondered why he hadn't come across her, or heard mention of her in Melford Cross. Steve, he called, do you realize there's no woman in this case? That isn't natural. There's Tracy Leonard, his wife replied. I doubt if there was a romantic link between her and Kelby, Leo or Ronnie would have said. So perhaps it was Ronnie, to get his hands on the inheritance. Well, that wouldn't be a fortune, said Paul. But he knew people had been murdered for less. He picked up the telephone and dialed Scott Reed's office. I'd rather find a woman in the case. He invited Scott over for dinner. He'll know about the girl, Paul explained to Steve. Anyway, I'd like to see Scott. The case does revolve around his missing diary, after all. That's true, said Steve. I wonder where it will end. Paul laughed. I don't think Scott's in danger. Whoever wanted it probably has the diary now, either Lady Delamore or persons unknown. But Steve was fascinated by the idea of a series of deaths arising out of the diary. It was an idea Paul had used once in an early novel. But the rest of the day, while she was alone in the house, she convinced herself that it was Scott Reed's last night on earth. Back at Melford Cross, Paul found Charlie Vosper at his field headquarters in the drill hall, sticking pins in a map of the district and biting into a bacon sandwich. What do you want? he snapped. Thought you might be lonely out here among the natives. Talk to Ronnie yet? Hobden, the local bobby, has got a low opinion of him, but he doesn't understand crime. He thinks it was Ronnie's fault that his father quarrelled with Mortimer. Paul nodded. But would Ronnie murder his dad? That depends. He seems a bit impetuous and spoiled, to put it mildly. He was arrested for drunkenness over in Boston, but he got off. Not much else. A uniformed constable came hurrying over to the desk. Sir, they found a note, a note from Mr. Kelby. Saying? Vosper asked. It says, of course I'll meet you if it's so important, but it had better not be at the house. You know how things have changed. Can we meet at the star where we used to meet, say, ten o'clock this evening? Yours, Alfred. Charlie Vosper muttered to himself while he assimilated the new information. Then he told the constable to continue the search. You'll never believe this, Paul said excitedly, but I said to Steve this morning that we need a woman in this case. I believe you. Did Kelby have a girlfriend this last few months? Paul asked the inspector. No, not at least since Ronnie came home. Nobody's mentioned a girl except you, Vosper snorted grimly. I saw him a few times with a young blonde on his arm at social functions, Paul added. Oh, really? Vosper visibly perked up at this. Let's go and ask Inspector Hobden if he knows anything about this. Walking round to the local police station, they found Hobden in his office. "'We need your help,' said Vosper. "'After all, you've known these people since they were so high.' He beamed encouragingly. "'Tell me the gossip on Kelby. Did he have girlfriends?' Hobden fidgeted uncomfortably. "'Um, there was a girlfriend a couple of years back, according to rumour, but she left Melford and went off to college somewhere. "'Was there a scandal?' I'm a policeman, Inspector Vosper, not a village barman. How would I know about Kelby's private life? He was discreet about it. His friends haven't told me about any old scandals before I came. Before you came? I've been responsible for this division for eighteen months. I came out from Oxford. They left the police station in disgust. What the devil's happening to village life? snapped Vosper. Paul telephoned Steve to say he was coming home. Had she eaten? No, she said excitedly. I've been trying to contact you all morning. Did you see the obituaries this morning? Yes, of course. Sir Philip Tranmere is dead. Don't you remember? He was the man I told you about who telephoned Lady Delamore yesterday. Paul remembered. He committed suicide last night. Paul went off and bought another copy of the Times. Tucked away at the foot of the obituary column was a small photograph of a flushed port face with military moustache and baggy eyes. Tranmere's distinguished military career had ended abruptly when he was arrested on suspicion of murdering Lord Delamore at a shooting party in Scotland. Some days later he had been released for lack of evidence, but that had been the end of his career. And now he was dead. The body of Sir Philip Tranmere was in the morgue, but it explained nothing. Sir Philip had jumped out of the window at his club shortly after midnight, a hundred feet onto the pavement.
It's really most irregular, sir, the club secretary repeated three times. We don't expect our members to do things like this here. The last time this happened was in 1892. Did Sir Philip seem worried these last few days? Paul inquired. We always took the view that the past was a long time ago, the secretary replied reprovingly. And Sir Philip was a gentleman. If he were worried, he would not have confided in the barman. Paul thanked him breezily and went through into the lounge. It was nearly empty, but for a man in a well-cut blue-gray suit standing three feet back from the barman, who announced he was closing shortly. Paul took the hint and left. Then he paid an unofficial visit to a friend just down the road in Whitehall. I'm not talking to you, Temple. Paul sat comfortably in a leather armchair and relaxed. Harry had a nice panoramic view of London from his window. He had got on since the days when he had been the youngest superintendent in the police force. Why ever not? asked Paul. You used that information I gave you about the permanent private secretary to the Ministry of Defence. You used it in a novel. I recognised the plot. Come off it, Harry. You can't even read. I don't need to. I'm telepathic. You're here about Sir Philip Tranmere. Paul grinned. Harry had been in charge of the investigation into Lord Delamore's death over twenty years ago. Not that Paul had known him in those days. Paul had been commissioned to do a series of newspaper articles on real-life detectives some time previously, and met Harry then. Now what's this I've been hearing about a diary? My inspector Vosper says it's gone missing. Paul nodded. Someone murdered Alfred Kelby to get hold of it. And Rover Tranmere has committed suicide. Well? I wondered what went on at the shooting lodge back when Delamore was killed. God knows, said Harry with a laugh. There was about fifteen people staying there, including the secretary and a couple of servants, and they were suffering from what we used to call the three A's, affluence, adultery, and alcohol. It was a hot summer, and I suppose they ran out of grouse. From sheer boredom they probably began shooting each other. They were a shabby, quarrelsome crew. Delamore acted as a kind of ringmaster, organising the revels to create the maximum drama and embarrassment. After a week, somebody shot him. It could have been any one of them, but finding out exactly who made solving Chinese puzzles look easy. They all lied about where they'd been at two o'clock that morning, or who they'd been with, and half of them were too drunk to remember. Why did you arrest Tranmere? Because I thought he'd done it. He hated Delamore, and he was Lady Delamore's lover. But there was no evidence. He couldn't remember whether he'd done it or not. Anyhow, I was relieved to let the whole affair die down. There was more pressing work to do. When Paul reached home at eight o'clock, he found Scott Reed waiting, and Steve had already scared him with her premonition of death. "'Who'd want to kill me?' he asked plaintively. "'I'm only a simple publisher.' "'Who else has read the diary?' Paul asked. "'Apart from Kelby, that is.' "'Nobody, apart from me, and, and Bella Spender. I, "'I doubt whether Kelby had time to read it "'because he disappeared half an hour after I left the diary with him. "'Who did the diary say killed Lord Tranmere?' Some minor diplomatic type called Price Pemberton. I've never heard of him. But the diary wouldn't be any use as evidence, would it? No, Paul said with a laugh. But I doubt you'd get Price Pemberton to sign your release. He might even sue you. He went to the who's who on his bookshelf, but Price Pemberton was not entered. He wasn't in the London telephone directory either. Paul telephoned Lady Delamore. It was a difficult conversation, because she claimed not to know Price Pemberton, and then, having remembered, affected not to have kept in touch. Little Willie was rather tiresome, she shrilled down the telephone, always wanted women older than himself. I was very relieved when he dropped out of the diplomatic service and retired to live on the Thames somewhere near Marlow, but of course he might have drowned in the last twenty-five years. Paul agreed and hung up, not feeling very much the wiser. "'Scott,' he said wearily, "'I suppose you'll go through with the business "'of asking everyone named in the diary to sign a release. "'Is it worth doing now? "'I don't know. "'You might get some interesting reactions.' "'He paused. "'I suppose you hadn't got round to approaching Sir Philip Tranmere?' "'Scott leaned forward in his chair. "'It's funny you should ask that, "'because I bumped into him the night before last. "'I met him at my club, just by chance, "'and he said he would sign.' He didn't seem very interested. How funny, Paul murmured. Perhaps you'd better not approach any of the others. Well, I've no idea where to find most of them. 
A lot of the debutantes and models are probably living abroad, and of course some of them will have died quite naturally. I was going to put an ad in the personal column of the Times, and then there are some policemen. Paul walked thoughtfully to the window and stared across the Thames. Speaking of debutantes, he said, Who was that blonde girl who used to be seen with Kelby? She's an attractive young thing. Oh, Jenny. She was his girlfriend. Jenny, eh? Tell me more. What did she do? She took all her clothes off at a party I gave to launch one of Kelby's books. My wife was appalled, but Kelby didn't seem to notice. She had a beautiful figure. What happened to her? I don't know. Perhaps she married a nice young man and settled down. Although I pity the nice young man. It might have been his imagination, or else Paul had seen a shadow move down in the mew's doorway opposite. It looked like a man standing back in the darkest corner. My goodness, said Scott, as the sound of the church clock on the other side of Battersea Park came clearly across the water. It was striking eleven. Is that the time? My wife will think I've been killed. It was ten minutes after eleven when Scott Reed left the house. Paul watched him from the upstairs window. Scott climbed into his rover, and while the car door was open, the interior light clearly showed a man sitting in the passenger seat. He appeared to say something, and then the car drove off towards the Albert Bridge. Kate Balfour was not the most efficient housekeeper in the world, yet the temples kept her on. She tried hard, and some of her cooking was truly excellent, but she often found better things to do with her time than housework, and her treatment of some of Paul's visitors was often deplorable. Only the previous month she had thrown a guest down the stairs and broken three of his ribs. The police force had never been a very good training ground for domestic service. She followed Scott Reed out of London and onto the Portsmouth Road in Paul's Jaguar. Scott Reed lived in Hambledon, just the other side of Godalming, and if the mystery passenger was going all the way with him, she wouldn't have much to worry about until she got there. She cruised along the Surrey Road at 70 miles an hour, about 25 seconds behind the rover. Her initial reaction to her assignment had been to curse Scott Reed for not living in Islington like every other publisher. Hambledon, after all, was the best part of a two-hour drive. But once past Seberton, her stout policewoman's heart was gradually uplifted by the countryside. The silver birches looked elegantly sparse in the full moonlight. The huge cliffs of sandstone that frequently towered on either side of the road were deceptively majestic. From time to time on the deserted road she glimpsed the rover ahead. Its tail lights blinked whenever Scott Reed braked, and sometimes she saw the car and its two passengers silhouetted on the crest of a hill. Going down the steep slope that was Guildford, she nearly ran into the back of them. They seemed to be chatting amiably enough. Some time later Kate was manoeuvring through the narrow, ancient streets of Godalming, and she felt again the tranquil atmosphere of the early nineteenth century. That was when she lost the car in front. She increased speed, hoping to reach Scott Reed's house before disaster befell him, and to hell with discreet tailing. She hit eighty through the rural wastes of Whitley, and then slowed down at the top of a hill. The publisher lived somewhere over to the left, if her memory served her well. She glanced at an impressive building on her right, and knew she was on the right road to Scott Reed's stockbroker's Tudor residence. As she pulled up to an imposing gateway beyond Hambledon Common, she noticed Scott and the mystery man were already letting themselves into Scott's house. Kate left the jaguar on the other side of the green, shinned over a wall with an agility that rendered her fifteen stone ridiculous, and crept up to the windows. She saw Scott Reed in his living room pouring drinks from the cupboard for the stranger. It was impossible to hear what they were saying, but they appeared to be on friendly terms. She noted the stranger's appearance, medium build, five feet eight, dark hair and swarthy complexion, aged forty to fifty, no distinguishing features. A crook. She walked back to the road where she saw a telephone box and decided to call her employer and keep him abreast of the situation. That was Kate, said Paul as he tossed his silk dressing gown onto the bed. She's down in Hambledon, Steve grunted. The mystery visitor is down there with Scott, drinking and chatting like an old friend. Well, there you are, she mumbled. I wonder how he means to get back to London. Darling, come to bed. Kate can look after herself. Poor Kate, I don't really think you like her. Nonsense. But I do think it's rather an affectation to employ an ex-policewoman as a domestic help. Shut up and say something romantic. 
Kate shuddered as she walked back to the village green. It was cold in the country. A few stray wisps of cloud were streaming across the face of the moon. The stars flickered icily. She thanked God for making her fat, though she called it generous, but then was forced to leap to one side as a maniac bore down on her in a fast car. Idiot! she shouted angrily. She memorized the registration number as a conditioned reflex as it was her police training. Three seconds later she spun round and shouted again, Hey, come back! It was Mr. Temple's Jaguar, but it was out of sight and on its way back to London. Next morning, Steve was forced to cook breakfast and burn the toast. I'm worried about Kate. The car's downstairs in the mews, and we've heard nothing from her. Hypocrite, Paul laughed. You know you don't get on very well. But you know the kind of man we're dealing with, Steve said heatedly. She may even be dead. I've already looked in the boot. It was empty. Who was the man she described? Paul sighed. It could have been anybody. He bit carefully into the toast and chewed thoroughly. You know what police descriptions are like, medium build, dark complexion. Everybody I know fits Kate's descriptions, except for a few women. This toast is rather well done, isn't it, darling? Beast, I think you should ring up Scott Reed. It was nice to see her agitated first thing in the morning. Steve was always tiresomely neat as soon as she woke up. It was a pleasant change to witness her slightly dishevelled. Paul piled on the agony. What did you do with this coffee? Tastes like you made it with the tea. Darling, instead of being terribly witty, shouldn't you be finding out what happened to that poor woman? He telephoned Scott Reed. It might sound a little odd, saying, please can I have my cook back, but Scott had to know something of her whereabouts. And he sounded evasive, which confirmed Paul's feeling that he knew more than he was letting on. No, I reached home safely, Scott assured him, but it's thoughtful of you to worry. There was a pause, during which Paul could envisage the publisher changing his mind and worrying and reversing his decisions. As a matter of fact, I bumped into an old friend when I left you, so nothing could have happened to me. He came all the way back to Hambledon. Who? Paul asked, trying to sound casual. Was that? Arthur Grover. He lives in one of the big houses here. Rather a dubious character, actually. We've always assumed he was a bit of a gangster. But last night I was glad about that, because Arthur thought we were being followed. I tell you, Paul, I'm, I'm rather jumpy. You were being followed, said Paul. Kate Balfour trailed you down there, and now she's missing. Kate? Missing? There was a pause. Arthur wouldn't have... It's only our joke over in the pub uh, about him being a gangster... Perhaps I should have a word with him. Paul Temple spent an hour or so checking on Arthur Grover. It was a name that sounded familiar, and Paul prided himself on knowing most of the gangsters in London and the South East. But somehow it was a name he associated with America. The club circuit, perhaps. But what was that sort of man doing in Surrey? I fancy a drink before lunch, said Paul. Shall we go down to the corner? Steve looked aghast. You've only just had breakfast. Isn't it a little early? I'll make it a tomato juice. We have some in the fridge. The pub on the corner was crowded, but with the best people. No petty criminals, only the big-timers. It was the best place outside Soho to keep in touch with what was happening, and Eric was a useful barman. Hello, Mr. Temple, he said as they reached the bar. I didn't know you'd got back from the States. I arrived back on Wednesday. What shall we have, Steve? A martini for me, she said sweetly. I'm trying to find out something about a man called Arthur Grover, Paul said when the drinks came. Arthur? He runs the casino club in Rygate Street, runs it with Neville the Knob, you know, Neville Delamore. I thought you met him in New York. It all clicked into place. Paul could almost see the face. He had met Arthur Grover briefly about three years previously. There had been some confusion over their seats at a club, and while the management sorted it out... The two men had done the English thing and had a drink together. Mr. Grover had given the impression that he was a club tycoon over there to study American methods. What does he look like? Paul asked. Well, said Eric, medium build, dark complexion. Oh, shut up, Paul laughed. Is he straight? Good Lord, no. Steve was listening in blank disbelief. If this man Grover is behind the theft of the diary, then Scott must be implicated as well. But Scott is entirely incapable of deception. 
He's the sort of person who'd be found out if he forgot to pay his fare on the bus. And why would he harm Kate? I think we need answers to all those points, said Paul. Eric, can I make a phone call? Paul looked up the number, then called the casino club. It was difficult to persuade them to put him through to Grover, until he mentioned the name of Temple. Then Arthur Grover was on the line instantly. I wanted to thank you for returning my car this morning, said Paul. I would have been sorry to lose that Jaguar, but I wondered when I could expect my cook to be returned. You cook? I don't know what you're talking about, he began. But then he thought of a better argument. I'll see you at Scott's home this afternoon. I want to talk to you anyway. Paul arrived at Hambledon at half past three. Arthur Grover turned out to be a sleek, sinister character with a lot of bustling energy and cigar-waving self-confidence. Paul remembered him as soon as he saw him. He was not a man who would be easy to intimidate. But he shook hands with Paul and growled hello. They went into Scott's living room where the publisher was serving tea. It was not a scene into which Soho mobsters fitted easily. I'm sorry, Paul. Scott Reed began nervously. I should have told you when you telephoned this morning, but I didn't know what to say. Why? What happened? Mr. Grover was waiting for me when I left you last night. Paul turned to Arthur Grover. I think you might as well do the talking. Arthur Grover bit into a small sandwich while he considered. I wanted to know what was going on. I read in the papers about Kelby being dead, and I wanted to know what had happened. You see, I stole the diary from Kelby, but I didn't kill him. Paul nodded. That made sense. I always said that Scott Reed ought not to be allowed to mix with the real world. There are too many people like you about Mr. Grover, and Scott gets himself into trouble. What do you mean? Scott blustered. Mr. Grover is a neighbor. You don't even know what happened, Paul. I can guess. I expect you talked to Mr. Grover in the saloon bar one evening over there in the pub on the green, where you both play the game of country squires. You probably told him about this extraordinary diary that you meant to publish. I, I may have done. You wouldn't have known that Neville Delamore was a respectable half of the Grover Delamore partnership that owns the casino club in Reigate Street, the English half. Paul Temple smiled at Grover. Arthur Grover is an American, so he has to have a respectable front man to satisfy the gaming board. He's never boasted to you of his aristocratic friends, Scott. Grover glowered round his cigar. Are you threatening me? Not at all. But you are slightly vulnerable, Mr. Grover. You know how nervous we are in this country of our gambling clubs being controlled by outsiders. I suppose if Neville Delamore needed a diary retrieving to preserve his family name, you could scarcely refuse. He's a bit of a snob like that, said Grover, and he didn't want his mother to be hurt, but Neville's a good boy. He didn't ask me any favors. I just said I'd get the diary back. Paul shrugged. Just like that. Yeah, just like that, Grover said, angrily stubbing out his cigar. I had the manpower. It was no trouble. On Monday morning, a gang of us went out to Melford Cross and picked up Kelby. The intention was to hold him until his secretary handed over the diary, but to our surprise, we found out that wasn't necessary. Because, Paul prompted, Kelby had the diary on him when he picked him up. Right, Mr. Temple. Then I telephoned the house and told Ronnie Kelby his father was safe and that he'd find him in the gardener's shed. Paul then turned to the nervous publisher. That's it, Paul. That's what Mr. Grover told me last night. He, he didn't murder anybody. Of course I didn't murder Kelby. I stole the diary, that's all. And gave it to Neville Delamore. Right. And what about Kate Belfour? What did you do with her? Arthur Grover sighed irritably. What would you do if you found someone on your tail? I put the boys onto her. Since then, she's been up at my house waiting for the outcome of our little discussion. He lit a cigar. So what is the outcome? I believe you, but I can't believe the police won't charge you with theft, and I can't guarantee that your gambling license will be renewed. Paul saw the sturdy figure of Kate Balfour striding across the common towards the house and went to the door to meet her. But, he called back to Arthur Grover, I'll tell Vosper you play by the rules. He likes that in a crook. The missing blonde appeared on the Saturday. Kelby was being buried in the churchyard at Melford Cross. It had been discreetly arranged by Tracy Leonard. Just a few close friends, the family, Paul Temple and Detective Inspector Charlie Vosper.
Some thirty-five people filed out of the tiny fourteenth-century church and followed the coffin to the graveside. So Lloyd George will have to wait a few more years, a distinguished historian murmured to Paul. There aren't many of us with Kelby's moral courage. Paul watched the strangely formal ritual of lowering the coffin, inaudible prayers swept away on the April winds, the scattering of the first handfuls of earth onto the box. Kelby's death was wantonly unnecessary, Paul reflected. At least when the Duke of Clarence was drowned in a butt of Malmsey, the English throne was at stake. Tracy Leonard was wiping away a single tear. She looked classical in her grief, tall like Electra and dressed in black. Whereas Ronnie Kelby was flushed and furious, as if he'd thought that his father had let him down again. At the end of the ceremony, he turned swiftly away and strode towards the wrought iron gates. But there was also the blonde, standing separate from the main congregation. It seemed as if everybody else at the funeral knew who she was, Paul sensed, because they pointedly ignored her. She was a source of embarrassment. Leo and Gladys were looking out of place, lurking among the people by the graveside as if they had no right to be there, servants among the gentry. When most other people had gone and the gravedigger began filling in the hole, Leo Ashwood remained staring. The blonde in black smiled at Leo as she left, but he stared bleakly through her. He didn't move until the coffin had been completely covered, and then he left without a word. Paul caught up with the blonde and fell into step beside her. Good morning. We've met before at Scott Reed's New Year party. I'm Paul Temple. I'm sorry we meet again under such unhappy circumstances. So am I. I remember you. You're the detective novelist. Yes, I understand you used to live in Melford. Of course, she turned to him with a radiantly artificial smile. And how nice it is to be back home. They had reached the gates of the cemetery. Vosper was standing there waiting beside his car. Hello, Jenny, he said, opening the door. Jenny got into the car without a murmur. The waft of her scent remained in the air to remind Paul that she had been beside him. Well, Temple, did you find the missing diary? No, although I did discover who stole it. I'm beginning to think it has no bearing on the case. I want to know about that diary. In fact, I was summoned to the assistant commissioner's office and warned off, told to lay off the official history side, which, of course, has served to make me even more curious about it. I'll see you in that pub over there at seven. Vosper climbed into the car beside Jenny and waved to the driver. Hold on, Charlie. What was the autopsy report on Kelby? Strangled, died of a broken neck. There wasn't a drop of water in his lungs. After Vosper had driven off, Paul wandered over to the hall, where he found Tracy Leonard and Ronnie Kelby in the library. I know this is not the time to intrude. That's all right, said Ronnie. Anything will help solve this damn mystery. Even, Tracy murmured ironically, you, Mr. Temple. Paul smiled at her irony. All I've managed to find out is that Mr. Kelby made an assignment with a woman at ten o'clock on the day of his murder, and we've no idea whether he kept it. What woman was this? Ronnie asked in astonishment. I don't know. Tracy Leonard had turned sickly pale. Do you know who it might have been, Miss Leonard? Why should I know? I'm only a secretary. Mr. Kelby's personal assignments would be his private affair. And where were you at ten o'clock that evening, Ronnie? Paul asked. Me? That was the time Tracy and I decided we weren't going to find my father and went to the police station. Paul nodded encouragingly. Was that before or after the phone call? Phone call? He was startled, and he glanced in alarm towards Tracy. What phone call? Didn't someone telephone on Monday evening? No. Nobody telephoned. Tracy shook her head in confirmation. We were together all evening. Gladys Ashwood then entered the room with a tray of tea and buttered crumpets and began surfing. How did you find America? Paul asked Ronnie, changing the subject. Did you make a fortune? No, the Carnegies and the Fords got there ahead of me. I'm broke, Mr. Temple. My father was trying to find me a job before he was... before he was strangled. You knew that? Paul asked, taking another crumpet. That he died of a broken neck? Yes, the inspector told me yesterday. He only told me this afternoon, but then you are next of kin. 
Look, Temple, I don't know what you're getting at, but my father is dead. Before Paul could make soothing noises, the young man had turned away in distress, and Tracy Leonard was being all maternal. Then Gladys Ashwood started weeping. This is hardly fair, Mr. Temple, Tracy Leonard said coldly. Ronnie was only just on the point of making things up with his father when Mr. Kelby died. That leaves a lot of guilt that needs careful handling, which you are singularly failing to do. And look what you've done to poor Gladys. Gladys was stumbling towards the door, mumbling, It isn't so. It isn't true. Her crying could be heard all the way down the passage and into the kitchen, and Tracy followed her out. Paul felt slightly awkward, and a few moments later went to see what he could do, finding Tracy outside the kitchen door. Is Gladys all right? She nodded. Look, the trouble with murder investigations is that all the humdrum secrets we usually live with are singled out for examination. Even the nicest man, by the time his idiosyncrasies have been given the once-over, can appear an alcoholic or egomaniac, a womanizer or a skinflint. I'd like you to know how much I admired Alfred Kelby. Her large brown eyes were sad as she smiled. I didn't admire him, Mr. Temple. I was in love with him, yet at the same time I despised him. There are no humdrum secrets, as you call them, between a man and his secretary. Was he in love with you? No. I think he might have loved me once during the summer I first came here. But then he lost interest, found someone else. I've meant nothing to Alfred these last four years. He must have been mad, Paul murmured. She grinned. Thanks. By the way, Paul added, almost as an afterthought, who was the blonde girl of the funeral today? That was Jenny Mortimer. Jenny Mortimer? Yes, Ted Mortimer's daughter. The Crown was one of those pubs that had been licensed in the 13th century for the accommodation of pilgrims, and it hadn't changed much. The low beams were the kind you bang your head on after ten o'clock, and the parlour was actually a parlour. There was no recognisable bar, and the customers had to sit round facing one another. Paul went into the public bar instead. He ordered a whisky. You're quiet here this evening, he said to the barman. We don't fill up till after eight o'clock, he replied. It was a few minutes past seven. You'll be down from London, I suppose, for a funeral this afternoon. That's right. Poor old Kelby. I suppose he was well known in the village. Ah, he polished a few glasses while he considered. Mr. Kelby did a lot for Melford Cross on the education. Not that he was that stuck up. He came in here with old Leo Ashwood now and again and had a point with him. Mr. Kelby was well liked. Paul brought the man a drink and gradually turned the conversation to public opinion in the village. Does anybody have a theory on how it happened? I'm not sure what you mean. Well, local gossip can be a lot better informed than the police's version of events. Do you mean you think they drowned him in the rain, but? The landlord asked incredulously. Well, everybody knows who done it, don't they? The police haven't the faintest idea. Oh, <laughs> yes. Well, they're the CID from London, ain't they? What would they know about Melford Cross? But the people hereabouts know who did it. You ask Inspector Hobden, he nodded darkly. We knowed as soon as Mr. Kelby went missing. Inspector Hobden couldn't even tell me the name of Kelby's girlfriend. The barman smiled cryptically and said that Hobden had to live with the people in Melford Cross. How do they know who done it? Uh, uh, did it? asked Paul, temporarily lapsing into the vernacular. A man, a farmer who don't like his animals, Mr. Temple, he's a wrong un. He'd be capable of killing a man, especially if he had a motive like money. And that's all Ted Mortimer cares about. Money. And his daughter? Paul asked. The barman grinned. Paul bought another whiskey and returned to the other side of the room. It was half past seven and still no sign of Vosper. 
Half a dozen local lads had come into the bar and were settling down for a social evening. Surely, he thought, Ted Mortimer couldn't have murdered Kelby for money, because he would still owe two thousand pounds to Kelby's estate. If it were Mortimer, it would have to be for a different reason. Paul wondered how Kelby came to lend the man two thousand pounds. Something to do with the girl? It was a lot of money for a neighbourly gesture. His reverie was dispelled by the sight of Leo Ashwood. The chauffeur come handyman arrived in the bar and ordered a double rum. The barman treated him like a regular, but he was not over-familiar. Leo was obviously well known as the strong, silent type. He stood and drank his rum with grim introspection. He hadn't noticed Paul in the corner. Hello, said Paul. How's Mrs. Ashwood now? Leo stared at him for a moment without answering, then managed to speak. She's in bed, sir. Took one of Miss Leonard's sleeping pills and went to bed early. She takes things hard, does Gladys. She was obviously attached to Mr. Kelby. He was a good employer. Leo knocked back the rest of his rum and banged the glass on the counter. I must be off. Good night, Mr. Temple. But he paused by the door and looked back. By the way, Mr. Temple, you do know that Mr. Kelby went across to Galloway Farm on Monday evening, don't you? He was seen there, whatever Ted Mortimer might say. Then he left. Detective Inspector Vosper didn't arrive at the pub until eight o'clock had gone. He bought half a pint of bitter and took Paul through into the parlour. I like to relax when I'm off duty, he said. I don't like people staring at me as if I'm a policeman when I'm drinking. He raised the half-pint glass. Cheers, Temple. Three regulars in front of the fire continued their animated discussion, which was punctuated by the odd bout of laughter. They took no notice of Temple and Bospo. Leo comes in here every night spreading rumours, the policeman said. He's been hitting the bottle since his boss was murdered, poor devil. Quite convinced that Ted Mortimer did it. There's one thing that puzzles me, and that's why Kelby lent Mortimer two thousand pounds. That's a lot of money, even for Kelby. He did it for Leo. What? Leo got himself into serious trouble when Jenny was fourteen. He had an affair with her, which could have meant prison because she was underage. Jenny used to visit Melford House after school, and apparently Kelby used to give her private coaching to get her through her school certificate. Not the sharpest knife in the drawer. Anyway, it looked pretty bad for Kelby as well. The gossips reckoned they were both having it away with her. But Kelby wasn't, not at that stage anyway. Paul went to the bar and fetched another round of drinks. That makes Leo rather a swine, he said as he returned to his chair. True, Bosper replied. Now, Temple, about the diary. Why have I been warned off? Over the next hour, Paul told him nearly all he knew, although he was rather vague about his visit to see Harry in Whitehall. You mean government security may be involved? Some politician's reputation at stake? No, Paul replied. I expect the assistant commissioner feels that the Delamore murder is his own case. Simple as that. Vosper wasn't happy, particularly about Neville Delamore's involvement with Arthur Grover in the casino business. In fact, he puffed on his pipe so much, the corner of the bar they were sitting in came to resemble a shunting yard. A telephone rang somewhere in the pub, and a few seconds later the barman came in search of Inspector Vosper. There had been an incident at a Galloway farm, and could the inspector go there immediately? On their arrival, they found Leo Ashwood sitting in the porch with his head between his knees. He didn't look up as they went past him into the kitchen. There, Ted Mortimer was having his cuts and bruises tended by his daughter. Who called the police? Vosper asked. I did, said the girl. My father was being beaten up. Leo was drunk. He looks quite docile out there at the moment, Paul ventured. He's been out there every night, banging on the doors and shouting in the road. My father has been living in terror these last few nights. What does he shout about? He accuses my father of killing Alfred Kelby. That's enough, Jenny, said Mortimer. I can fight my own battles. Just then, Leo entered the kitchen, followed by a young man in a Macintosh and carrying a large camera. Oh, said Jenny, so you've brought the press with you now? And with that, she flew across the kitchen and attacked Leo with a large frying pan. Leo cowered against the dresser as blows rained down on him, and Jenny kneed him in the groin. That'll make quite a picture, said the reporter, who'd managed to capture the more dramatic moments of the assault before shuffling out. Jenny gave a brisk laugh. 
I learned how to handle Leo when I was fourteen. And I know my father too. He makes enemies easily and loses money with every project he's ever taken up. When things had died down, Paul took the opportunity of having a word with the feisty young girl. When was the quarrel between your father and Kelby? Was that why you wanted to see him? She looked surprised. I don't think there was a quarrel. Just that out of the blue, Alfred started asking for the money back, that was all. That was why I wrote him the letter asking to see him. He was ruining my father. Why did he suddenly want the money back? I don't know. Vosper interrupted their conversation. Let's go, Temple. Later in the car, the inspector gave vent to another outburst against country types before growling, And I want to know how Sir Philip Trenmere fits into all this, and little Willie Price Pemberton. God, what a case this is turning out to be. It was past eleven o'clock, and Paul had still not come home from wherever he had gone to. It must have been a long funeral. His absence gave Steve the opportunity to do some of the things which he laughed at when he was home. While he'd been in America, she had used a face pack on three occasions, and it hadn't done her complexion any harm. She'd given herself a nasty turn when she'd glimpsed herself in the mirror, and when she smiled, it looked as if her face was flaking. Bumping noisily along the bedroom floor on her bottom and hoisting her hips in the air and bicycling her legs was much more fun. Steve fundamentally believed in exercise. She lay on the sheepskin rug, panting from the exertion of touching her toes twenty times, and she went up to bed feeling fit and beautiful. She turned out the bedside lamp. Perhaps there had been a wake after the funeral, sending the dead cheerfully on their journey and renewing life on earth. Steve knew what she would say if Paul arrived home with whiskey on his breath. She didn't like the sound of that Tracy Leonard with her aura of mystery and total self-possession. What was the point of keeping an ear to the ground in Melford? Sir Philip Tranmere had never been near the place, and they knew Lady Delamore had the diary in her possession. There were two perfectly obvious alternatives to choose from. Go and steal the diary back, or do some more exercises. She had already visited Lady Delamore's London house on a previous occasion, so maybe it was time she returned, only this time at the dead of night. She pushed back the bedclothes and slipped out of bed. She dressed quickly in the dark and went quietly out of the house. Driving to the other side of London, she parked her car in the square across from the towering silhouette of the Delamore residence. Hurrying down the stairs that led to the basement flat, she slipped a short metal ruler against the catch and pushed open the door that led directly into the butler's kitchen. The first thing she heard were gentle snores emerging from her room along the corridor on the right, and so, carrying a slim battery torch, she tiptoed past and up some stairs to the main hallway. The door into Lady Delamore's drawing-room was at the end of the hall. The floors were thick with carpets, which helped her move soundlessly and fast to the door. It was the room where she'd first been received on Thursday, so she knew the geography without falling over armchairs. A faint moonlight helped as Steve set about searching the room. She felt behind all the cushions, moved the books in the bookcase, and looked in the cupboard in the corner. The escritoire in the window was locked, so Steve set to work with it with a hair grip. Then she caught sight of a chauffeur-driven car drawing up outside. Steve watched as two men emerged and went up to the door of Delamore House. They knocked with the heavy authority of the police, and almost at once there were footsteps on the stairs, the front door was opened, and there were voices in the hall. Steve looked about her in alarm and was struggling to hide when the lights were turned on. It was nearly midnight. The Thames near Marlow threaded into a black nothing of fields and towpaths, with barely a light from the houseboats moored alongside to show them the way. The water lapped noisily against the hulks, and occasionally a fish surfaced, splashed, and left a strange silence behind, to be broken eventually by the rustle of a vole or water rat in the bank. What a strange place to choose to live, Charlie Vosper whispered loudly. Paul guided him back onto the path. One of these craft, the Gay Deceiver, was home to Willie Price Pemberton and his cat Madge. It has its charm, Inspector, away from the hurly-burly of London. It's so damn noisy. Listen to that owl. It was noisy. The houseboats creaked a lot, and there was a breeze crackling through the trees. <laughs> 
I like the hurly-burly of London, said Vosper. The river formed a natural basin in the bow downstream from the weir, and the basin was lined with houseboats. A colony inhabited by weekend people and actors and retired sea captains. About thirty-five people conspiring to keep out the real world. An exactly suitable place for Willie to pass his declining years. He could sit on the poop deck on Sunday mornings and watch the girls in sailor hats empty the sluices and fetch the milk. Willie Price Pemberton claimed that you saw all of life from the poop deck of the gay deceiver, or at least all of it that he wanted to see. Willie was an observer now, not a doer. A cat lover. It's never dark like this in London, Charlie Vosper whispered. What do you want to see? Paul asked. Bloody bogeymen, Temple, that's what I keep thinking we're being followed. That's because we are being followed. The snapping of dry twigs, and as he came closer the distinct outline of a man confirmed the fact. Let's go back, said Charlie. I've been warned off. You're with me, said Paul, remember? I haven't been warned off. You're just not supposed to be here. Correct. A quick flash of Paul's pencil torch confirmed that they had reached the Gators Eva. The gangplank was moving gently beside them as the breeze took the boat downstream and the tension of its moorings pulled it back, a gentle swaying motion that should be lulling Willie into a deeper, fuller sleep. While they remained by the gangplank, indecisively wondering whether to go back or surreptitiously nip aboard, the footsteps caught up with them and a strong torch beam was shone in their faces. Paul took out a cigarette and asked the man for a light. "'Don't you dare make a fight of it, Temple!' came a voice from the darkness. Harry, I should have guessed it was you. And I guess that this is where you'd be coming. Vosper, what the hell are you doing here? You've been warned once. Just keeping an eye on Mr. Temple, sir? Well, sod off back to London. They were interrupted by a voice from the direction of the river. I say there, are you going to be talking all night? There's someone trying to get some sleep here. Harry strode up the gangplank, pulled back the tarpaulin over the steering cabin and jumped down. Paul followed. The last they saw of Charlie Vosper that evening was the flare of the match as he lit his pipe. You aren't going to sleep yet, Bryce Pemberton, said Harry. Batten the hatches and let us aboard. Go away, cried Bryce Pemberton. It's after midnight. Paul, persuade the silly ass to open up, will you, said Harry, taking a nip from a silver flask he'd fished out of his breast pocket. Paul introduced themselves through a tiny open porthole. He explained that they'd come to talk because Sir Philip Tranmere had committed suicide. They thought Willie might be in trouble as well, so they'd come to help. There was no reply from inside the boat until Paul mentioned Margaret Spender's diary. You'd better come in, said Price Pemberton. He unbolted the latch and let them through. Are you going to arrest me? he asked nervously. No, said Harry. You remember me. I'm the friendly policeman who investigated Lord Delamore's death all those years ago. I suppose you bullied poor old Tranmere into committing suicide. Rubbish, replied Harry. Rover topped himself because his exploits were recorded in the diary, and the diary is about to be published. Simple as that. Willie Price Pemberton blinked a few times, but said nothing. The diary names you as Lord Delamore's murderer. It was all a long time ago, said Willie. Were you Lady Delamore's lover? Of course not. You made love to her on three recorded occasions. A few beads of sweat appeared on Willie's bald head. That's not the same thing, he said. Anyway, she made love to me. She was the one who made all the running. I know, said Harry. Lady Delamore also told anyone who cared to listen that you were incapable of satisfying her. In fact, there's a very amusing passage in the diary about you taking a bath at the hunting lodge. Madge used to humiliate people as a matter of course. I should have known better, but she fascinated me. It was the most hellish summer I ever spent. The world's a better place without Delamore. And anyway, Rover Tranmere was Madge's lover, not me. He challenged me to a duel, you know. Yes, said Harry, it's all in the diary. How do you know what's in the diary? Paul asked. Shh, he said. Carry on, Willie. Well, Rover and I fought our duel in the woods. Lord Delamore was the only other person there acting as referee. We walked our fifteen paces, turned and fired at each other, and Lord Delamore dropped to the ground with a bullet in his head. 
Rover and I both ran like mad back to the lodge. I wouldn't know which of us shot him, but it was an accident. Paul was growing troubled about the reason behind Harry's visit. He knew that any good defence lawyer would get little Willie acquitted of any charges, and even Harry knew that because he wasn't about to make an arrest. Is that all? asked Willie. That's all, thank you. Toodle pip. Paul followed him out onto the deck. They left Willie Price Pemberton downstairs, ashen on his bunk and stroking the cat. Is that what you did to Sir Philip Tranmere? Paul eventually asked Harry. That's right. Look, I don't ask those silly asses to commit suicide. What I ask is that they don't go blabbing and making me look like a fool for not getting the right answer in the first place. You say those silly asses. You didn't do that to Kelby, did you? Of course not. Kelby wasn't involved in Delamore's death. They reached the ministry car and climbed inside. The driver moved off at once, and Harry barked, Delamore House, at him, before sinking back into his seat. Well, at least they hadn't killed him themselves. He felt rather like crying, but instead he lifted Madge up to his cheek and brushed his face against her fur. Poor Madge. She hadn't done anything to deserve this. He wondered what would happen to her. He poured the remaining whiskey into a tumbler and tried to compose himself. He lit a cigarette. There was no reason why he shouldn't chain-smoke now. Finish the whole packet. No need to fear any of the usual things like the neighbours laughing at him or falling into the river and drowning. Although drowning was supposed to be a peaceful death. He sipped at the whiskey. The warm excitement flowed through his blood. For the first time in years he felt contented, in control of his own life. Sixty years was enough anyway. He'd learned all there was to know about himself, done the things he'd meant to do and given up early. The past ten years on the boat had been pleasant, but repetitive, even boring, really. He was grateful for the sudden intrusion of drama. People would find him interesting for once, remember who he had been, and they would call him enigmatic. He didn't feel like crying. He felt sad, nostalgic for someone he had never been. Sad at the failure of it all. Come along, Matt, he murmured. Your country needs you. He finished the whiskey, lit another cigarette, and turned out all the lights. He closed the hatches and tied down the tarpaulins as he left the boat. There was no point, but it made the place look tidy. He wondered absurdly whether to cancel the milk. There was now a tear running down his left cheek, he discovered, as he smiled. But it was sadness, he told himself, not fear. He set off upstream along the towpath. He was glad it was so dark. It meant that nobody would see him crying. There was a stockbroker in the next boat. He was old, more than sixty-five, brim-faced and ruthless. One of these evenings he would die of a heart attack. Then there was old Mrs. Dalgleish, who also lived alone. She was the only atheist he knew who bought candles and cried out for Christ in her sleep. He wondered whether to feel sorry for them. The big boat belonged to Captain Blair, who drank a bottle of rum every day and kept falling off the gangplank. Captain Blair missed the life of adventure he'd been used to at Gosport. A small man with ginger whiskers and red eyeballs. All of life, he murmured to himself as he looked back at the thirty-five boats concealed in the night. There wasn't really anything more, except the diplomatic corps and shooting holidays. Maybe there had been in the early years of the century, but not now. Madge was struggling to get away. It was the noise of the weir that frightened her, but the noise was partly why they'd come to this spot. It would drown the shouts if his nerve failed him at the last moment. He knelt on the ground by the iron causeway across the weir and tied a piece of cord to Madge's collar. He tied a brick to the other end of the cord. It was a heavy brick from the derelict wall of the old lock, already soaked with water. It's all for the best, he said to the cat. You'll be safer. 
Having dealt with Madge, he turned his attention to himself. He put up his hand to hold his nose and jumped. The cries for help were lost in the deafening weir, and by the time his body drifted away from the swirling water below the falls, he was dead. The little grey-haired old lady was as daunting as Steve had described her. She kissed Harry on the cheek, and as she offered Paul a frail hand, she told him he was too good-looking. "'I prefer my men a little more rugged,' she said. "'You look more suitable for the drawing-room. Why don't you sit down?' Paul sat down. "'I've sent poor Simpson to bed,' she explained. "'Young people need their sleep, I seem to remember. "'And when Simpson is out of his bed after one o'clock, "'he smashes plates and yawns as he opens the door. "'Harry, darling, would you pour Mr. Temple whatever he drinks "'and help yourself to the whisky? "'Harry poured the whiskies. "'I had the pleasure of meeting your wife, Mr. Temple, "'yesterday or last month. "'Such a charming girl and very persistent. "'I hope she discovered whatever it was she wanted to know from me.' "'Yes, she did,' said Paul. She confirmed that you had Margaret Spender's diary. She laughed. My son gave it to me. He thought I'd be hurt by what poor Margaret had written about my late husband and myself. He's a dutiful boy, but conventional in a rather tiresome way. I sometimes wish I'd never gone through with all the messy business of childbirth. I might have kept my youth by now. I found the diary highly amusing, and it brought back so many fond memories. Didn't you think, Harry... I feel happier now the gossip can't be authenticated. I'd forgotten how amusing my late husband was. Come on, Madge, said Harry, let's get it over with. She went to a delicate little escritoire in the corner of the room and took out a small packet. Poor Rover, she sighed. It was such fun that summer. She smiled sadly at Paul and gave him the packet. This is for you. Is this it? Paul asked in surprise. There was a sound from the direction of the window. Lady Delamore sniffed and looked around suspiciously. That's it, said Harry. You can give it to your friend Scott Reed. Tell him he can go ahead and publish it now. Paul was flicking through the green ink pages when Lady Delamore asked him whether he used Adagio perfume. He assured her he never used scent and bathed daily. Then we must have a burglar. She prodded savagely into the curtains behind her. Ouch! Lady Delamore pulled the sash, which drew the curtains back in a dramatic clatter of steel rollers. Paul and Harry rose simultaneously to their feet, prepared for battle. But then they relaxed. Huddled in the corner was a slim, black burglar, which uncoiled bashfully into Steve Temple. She blinked at them and tried to grin. "'Why, Mrs. Temple, how unexpected! You must have arrived a few minutes before your husband. I thought I heard beads jangling in the hall. I suspect you came up through the basement.' Steve nodded. "'I do hope you didn't wake up Simpson as you passed his quarters,' Lady Delamore said severely. "'He gets very frightened of burglars and is quite liable to give in his notice tomorrow.' "'No,' Steve murmured. "'I was very quiet.' Then she turned angrily on her husband. "'What are you laughing at, you big ape?' "'There's a piece of your face back flaking off just above your eye.' Paul led her from the house, still smiling. "'Harry said publish and be damned,' Paul said wearily. "'A diary can't do any harm. "'And now a perfectly harmless little man has committed suicide because of it. "'You'd have to compose yourself to die, "'whether you're hanged near Hindhead or drowned near Marlow. "'Little Willie was the type who'd be afraid of pain, and he'd hate the cold. "'I suppose stepping into the Thames was brave by his lights.' "'Yes, dear. "'I suppose Kelby must have been pretty scared as well. "'Poor Kelby.' Steve put her arms around Paul's neck from behind. Do you know who murdered him? Yes, probably. But God knows what we can do about it. The key to the whole case is Arthur Grover. The front doorbell rang. That must be Scott, Steve said. It's all right, darling. I'll let him in. Paul unlocked a drawer and took out the diary, experiencing a moment of dread in case it wasn't there. But there it was, a troublesome and unnecessary document. "'Mr. Temple?' a woman's voice was asking in the hall downstairs. "'What is it?' Steve asked in bewilderment. "'Are you ill?' "'Tell your husband.' Paul hurried out to the landing and saw Gladys Ashwood slumped against the door, her arms outstretched, her face clenched in horror. Paul ran down the stairs four at a time. "'What's happened, Gladys?' 
he called. She tried to raise her head to look at him. He knew, she gasped, about being strangled in the car. Her eyes closed and she collapsed onto Steve, then fell to the floor. There was a knife between her shoulder blades. Paul, Steve shouted. Paul, where are you going? Paul ran out into the mews. It was almost dark now, and the fog had made visibility worse. He could just make out the taillights of a taxi turning into Chester Square. And there was somebody coming across the street, a man with light footsteps. It turned out to be Scott Reed. Steve, call a doctor, Paul shouted, and after that, ring Charlie Vosper. Scott Reed was breathless and dishevelled. His clothes were dusty and there was a cut over his forehead. He didn't speak when Paul took his arm and led him upstairs. He stared numbly at Gladys Ashwood, but didn't say anything. Gladys Ashwood was dead. It took about an hour for the murder squad to go through their usual routine. Photographs and fingerprints, preliminary details of time and place, taking away the body. Meanwhile, Steve was bathing Scott's forehead and making soothing noises. It was all becoming, Paul reflected, repetitious. He wasn't surprised that Charlie Vosper arrived on the scene in a mood of blustering irritability. How are you feeling, Mrs. Temple? I've just had a very large drink, Inspector, and I feel a lot better. Vosper leaned over and examined Scott's forehead. The publisher was trying to stand, but he was in obvious pain, and he sank back into a chair. Vosper clucked unsympathetically and then consulted one of the attending policemen's notebooks. Mrs. Temple, he said in puzzlement, are you quite sure Mrs. Ashwood said he knew about being strangled in the car? Yes. Is that all she said? Well, yes. He knew about being strangled in the car, the inspector repeated to himself. I wonder what she meant by that. I don't see what was so important about her message that she came all this way to London or that someone had to kill it to stop her going into detail. If you ask me, Scott Reed piped surprisingly from his chair in the window, she was trying to say something about poor old Alfred. Vosper swung on him. What makes you think that, sir? Well, I mean, wasn't Kelby strangled before he was put in the rain butt? Yes, he was. Perhaps you could tell us what else you know. Scott was hazy about what had happened. I was walking towards the mews when a taxi drove past me. I recognised the occupant. It was Gladys Ashwood. When I arrived at the mews, she'd already got out of the taxi. Then I heard the sounds of a scuffle, and the next thing I knew, someone was running towards me. He obviously didn't see me, because he knocked me over. And as I was falling, I made a grab for his legs. Not to attack him, really, more an instinctive grab to support myself. And then he kicked out and hit me in the face. I was lucky I wasn't blinded. Would you recognise him again if you saw him? No, it was dark by then, and foggy. But he was about my height and, and a great deal heavier. Vosper sighed. Do you think the man was already in the mews, waiting for Mrs Ashwood when the taxi arrived? Yes, I think he must have been, said Scott. It's my bet he was standing in the shadows near the opposite garage. Yes, Vosper agreed. That seems very likely, very likely indeed. Thank you, Mr. Reed. By the way, one of my men picked up a shoe out there. Quite a nice brogue shoe. The inspector produced the shoe with all the panache of a conjurer. What do you think of this, Mr. Reed? I don't know. Scott took the shoe and examined it, then passed it to Paul. Size nine, handmade. Colson's of Bond Street, he murmured. Our friend has very expensive tastes. Colson's? Scott asked in surprise. Yes, of Bond Street. Do you buy your shoes there, sir? Vosper asked Scott. Yes, he admitted, but I'm not the only one. Lots of my friends buy their shoes from Colson's. Paul looked across at Steve and smiled sadly. The jigsaw puzzle was complete in his mind, but there wasn't a scrap of indictable evidence. Charlie, he said, pouring the inspector another drink without asking, I want a word with you. Scott made his excuses, and Steve escorted him to the front door, leaving the two men alone. Before Paul could say anything, Charlie took a folded-up evening paper from his raincoat and tossed it across to him. There was a photograph of a very photogenic Jenny Mortimer kneeing Leo Ashwood in the groin. The accompanying story described how Jenny had had a date to meet Kelby at ten o'clock to discuss her father's debt.
Paul looked up in horror. You realise this is going to get her killed? Why? asked Fosper. Because it implies that she was in the immediate vicinity of the murder. She might even have witnessed it, or seen the murderer pass by on his way to dump the body on Mortimer's farm. Yes, but don't interrupt me while I'm thinking aloud. Don't you know why Gladys Ashwood was killed tonight? She was killed because our murderer is on the run. She was on to him, and now he'll think Jenny is on to him. He's desperate, Charlie. He'll kill again with no compunction whatsoever. Vosper was bewildered. Do you think Jenny Mortimer saw it happen? It doesn't matter what I think. The point is that in order to cover his tracks, the murderer will have to get rid of her just in case. Blast that photographer. He stood up. Look here, Temple, do you know who this killer is? Of course I do. So what's the next move? Vosper was a worried man. We must look after Jenny Mortimer. If we can keep her safe for the next twenty-four hours, I reckon we can crack this case. At the moment, we could never prove a thing. Paul smiled reassuringly at the policeman. Don't worry, I'll give you proof, Charlie. I promise you I'll give you the proof. I just need help from two people. As Charlie Vosper prepared to leave, there was a ring at the doorbell downstairs. I'll let them in, Charlie said as he shook hands with Steve. Good night. Paul watched him out from the landing. He watched Charlie Vosper open the front door and heard him say, What the hell? Jenny Mortimer was standing on the step with an evening paper in one hand and a weekend case in the other. My dear Mrs. Temple, I have been set up as the next murder victim. Did you expect me to sit pathetically at home and wait for the knife in my back? Look at this newspaper report. Don't you have a big, strong boyfriend you could stay with? Steve asked icily. Jenny shrugged. Only your good-looking husband had the courtesy to talk to me at the funeral, and I couldn't stay in the village. So here I am. Paul picked up the suitcase and carried it upstairs. You're very welcome to stay, isn't she, darling? Of course, darling. Let me show you to the guest room. He led her upstairs to the room opposite their bedroom. A murderer would have to climb fifty feet of sheer wall to reach the window, or come up through the inside of the house. Paul watched her bounce on the bed and wondered whether she was truly afraid of death. She grinned at him. It was difficult to imagine Jenny dead. Her body was so full of life and pleasure. I'll leave you to settle in, Paul said as he deposited the case on the bed. Downstairs, Steve was cleaning up with grim ostentation. She clattered about in the kitchen and then spoke to Paul about the girl's comfort with brittle formality. I didn't know she'd turn up here, he said lamely. I'm not complaining. Paul poured himself a whiskey. It's all right, I'll soon have this case cleared up. Good. The poor girl is scared. So I see. It was a difficult evening. Steve became heavily ironic about the big manly protector, and then Jenny came downstairs to suggest they throw a party. It would take all our minds off this awful business. No party. But the girl spent the next forty minutes on a series of telephone calls to advise her friends that she was alive and well and living with Paul Temple. Eventually Steve went upstairs to wash her hair, and Jenny, relaxing, draped herself along the sofa. Your wife's a bit peeved, isn't she? Paul turned round and nodded. Slightly. Are you in love with her? Of course. She looks pretty tough. I don't suppose you stood a chance when she decided to marry you. Shall we stay up talking all night? I can tell you the story of my life. You can use it in your next novel. Shall I tell you how I seduced Leo Ashwood? I did it for a dare. I could tell from the way he was always staring at me that he was twisted up with frustration. He used to stand behind me when I was playing. Tell me about Alfred Kelby. I didn't seduce Alfred. He was a sort of father to me. I think he was trying to make up for what Leo had done, poor thing. She laughed with her mouth open. Alfred was really an English gentleman. He accepted responsibility for the actions of his servants. We didn't sleep together till I was nineteen. Tracy Leonard was his mistress. Not for several years past, said Paul. She giggled complacently. Do you think she's better looking than me? Yes. It wasn't until after midnight and the best part of a bottle of whiskey that Paul managed to persuade Jenny to turn in and went to his own room. Steve lay on her side, pretending to sleep. 
She'd hit the hay a long time previously. Paul prodded her and tried to say friendly things about how tiresome young girls can be. If she's still here tomorrow, Steve suddenly piped up, fully awake, I'll murder her myself. Tracy Leonard went into the church by herself. A single bell was tolling, calling the faithful of Melford Cross to worship. About fifty people were trailing across the green. Paul Temple climbed out of his jaguar and joined the congregation. He took a hymn book from the verger as he entered the church, murmuring, Good morning, and sat in the pew opposite Tracy Leonard. The organist was doodling a tuneless variation on a theme by Bach. Is this a pleasant coincidence? Tracy Leonard whispered when she realized who was sitting next to her. Very pleasant, Paul whispered. Her scent contrasted nicely with the dust and leather smell of the church. She looked serenely poised in her grey two-piece. Paul wondered again why Alfred Kelby had let her go in favour of Jenny Mortimer. Paul had found himself immensely relieved as he left home. He hadn't realised what a strain the girl's presence had put on them all. She was enjoying her role at the centre of a murder case. Tracy Leonard was more classically English. Why have you come here? she asked. I wanted to see you. Perhaps we could have a talk when the service is finished, on our way up to the house. She agreed. But I have an awful lot to do. The police are still disrupting us with their questions. I'd like to be back as soon as possible. The choir and vicar were moving up the aisle. The service was beginning. Paul relaxed for an hour to enjoy religion in the simple community. He appreciated Christianity with fields and animals and the wind whistling outside the church, where the changing seasons affected one's life and men worked to produce a visible necessity for their own lives. And the congregation made a joyfully restrained English noise. The choir was better if you closed your eyes. They sounded enthusiastic, unsubtle and happy. They looked like the local schoolmaster, a garage mechanic, a few farm labourers, and a reluctant rabble of schoolboys. Paul was oddly moved by the soloist, a fleshy man of fifty with an unhealthy face and a beautiful tenor voice. His voice soared to the beams of the church when he sang, clutching his stomach and looking absurdly pleased with himself. He was the kind of man who came into his own each Sunday when his friends stopped laughing and the village listened to him in awe. It was sad, Paul thought, that the vicar didn't realise the importance of his rural authenticity. He tried to relate God and his congregation to the big wide world, and so the mood was dispelled. He preached a sermon on the commandment, Thou shalt not kill, with examples from that morning's newspaper coverage of the Kelby story. The vicar was uncompromisingly against murder, Paul wondered, as the service ended and the flock moved slowly out into the midday drizzle, how many people the vicar thought he had saved from the gallows and eternal damnation. "'Why on earth did you come here?' Tracy asked. "'We could perfectly well have talked at the house. "'I wanted to see you away from the others.' "'The others?' she repeated in surprise. "'Mr. Ashwood, Ronnie Kelby, the police, anyone who might be around.' "'She seemed about to say something.' but she changed her mind and led the way to the gate. Paul fell into step beside her. She refused his offer of a lift in the dry Jaguar. She always walked to church and back every Sunday. Hers was an ordered life. What happened last night, Mr. Temple? she asked after a moment. Why was Gladys murdered? Because she knew who killed Alfred Kelby. Tracy walked on in silence. There were flowers in the hedgerow already, but Paul didn't know what they were. Small white flowers, probably weeds, and the fields looked very green in the slight rain. He resented the way London prevented him from knowing the time of the year. It was nearly three months since they'd stayed in their country cottage. He and Steve had spent Christmas there. Who did kill him, Mr. Temple? she asked tensely. The same person who killed Gladys, he said noncommittally. Miss Leonard, after we found Kelby's body, I talked to Leo Ashwood and his wife in the kitchen. I know, she said impatiently, I was there. You weren't in the kitchen. Mrs. Ashwood said she had to go into the village because she'd forgotten something. That's right, a suit of Mr. Kelby's. 
She sent it to the cleaners. People worry about irrational things in moments of crisis. Did she return to the village? Yes, said Tracy. She glanced at him sardonically. Mr. Reed gave her a lift. She clearly regarded the subject as irrelevant, but she tried to be helpful. Mr. Reed called round just as you left. He'd heard about the murder, and of course he was very upset. He embarrassed everyone by apologising about the diary and explaining that he had never imagined it would lead to this. I just had to get rid of him. Paul grinned. It was a scene he could imagine only too clearly. So I asked him to give Gladys a lift into the village. That got rid of both of them. How did Gladys get back? Her husband picked her up later. She faltered in her stride and turned to Paul. Incidentally, Mr. Reed telephoned me yesterday afternoon. He wants to talk to me about Mr. Kelby's will. Apparently he and I are executors. You sound a little surprised, said Paul. Didn't you know Mr. Kelby had appointed you as executor? No, I didn't, she continued up the hill again. Well, I suppose I did. He said something about it ages ago, but he was always changing his mind about wills and that sort of thing. He probably imagined that every change in his will gave him a new lease of life. He was very superstitious. He didn't like to think that his death had been settled. When they reached the top of the hill, Paul looked back at the village. It was a village like most others, but the design had never been improved on. He liked it. Look, Mr. Temple, I don't want to be rude, but you still haven't told me what you want. Eh? No, that's true, I haven't. Paul smiled and turned away from the view. Last night I stuck my neck out and told Inspector Vosper I could solve this case. I told him I could solve it within twenty-four hours, provided two people were willing to help me. I was referring to you, Miss Leonard, and a man called Arthur Grover. I've never heard of Arthur Grover. Paul laughed. I don't expect you have. And I can't imagine I would be able to help you. I want you to go to the cinema, he said enigmatically, ignoring her look of astonishment. I could go to the one in Oxford, she ventured. That's usually got something worth seeing on. Good idea. Go tonight. He kissed her on the cheek and left her wondering which of them was mad. Paul returned to London and decided to take Steve out on the town. She sat in the passenger seat of the Jaguar and watched the lights of Soho flash gaudily by. So how was your day? she inquired. Pretty good. Got back from Melford Cross about two and went out for lunch with Scott. Did you discuss your new novel? No, Kelby. They parked in the street behind the casino club and walked back. Why this place in particular? Steve asked. It's owned by Arthur Grover and Neville Delamore. She stopped in the entrance and turned to Paul. You mean we're here on business? I thought we were having an evening out. Just you dare spoil it, Paul, that's all. A man in an admiral's uniform saluted them as they walked in. The foyer was crowded with rich people who had money to lose on the top floor. Paul took Steve's arm and guided her gently through to the cocktail bar. Good evening, he said to the bartender. My name is Paul Temple. Mr. Grover is expecting me. Yes, of course, sir, he said with a smile. I'll let Mr. Grover know you're here. Paul said, You remember what Arthur Grover told me about his telephone call to Ronnie Colby on the day the old boy disappeared? Yes, Steve replied, that his father could be found in the garden shed. Well, he's making another phone call tonight. Another call? Steve looked at him for a moment. Why? Because I've asked him to. Before Paul could explain, Arthur Grover had arrived, waving his cigar and calling good evenings in all directions. Good evening, Mrs. Temple. What would you like to drink? He flicked his fingers at the bartender. Frank here mixes the best martinis in London. Steve nodded approvingly. I gather you're helping my husband. Yeah, isn't that generous of me? To stay in business, an American club owner has to help all kinds of people, but I keep a list of them. He laughed good-naturedly. If I ever see your husband down on the floor, I'll kick his head in. Paul laughed. The previous telephone call had been made on Monday at a quarter to nine, so they stayed in the bar exchanging pleasantries. Then, at a quarter to nine, they went through into Grover's office. Of course, last Monday I used the public call box, he said as he picked up the phone and dialed. Paul heard the voice on the other end of the line as Grover said, <laughs> 
Good evening. I've spoken to you once before, Mr. Kelby, on the night your father disappeared. The night you killed him and took the body to Galloway Farm. He nodded to Paul, confirming that he was speaking to the same man as before. I'm Arthur Grover, and you know perfectly well what I'm talking about. Your father was alive when we left him in the garden shed, and he was alive when you found him. There was a long pause. Paul wondered whether the person on the other end of the line had hung up. Suddenly Grover winked. Yes, Mr. Kelby, of course I can prove it. I have a photograph of you carrying the body out of the shed. The man on the other end began talking quickly and excitedly. Grover gave Paul the thumbs-up sign. The trick had worked. Come along, Steve. Let's go and enjoy that meal. They left the office and went downstairs to the dining room. That was hardly a conclusive phone call, Steve said. What's going to happen now? Grover is arranging to meet the man who killed Alfred Kelby, to hand over the photographs. Steve smiled knowingly. But instead of Grover, you'll keep the appointment. That's right, Steve. Tomorrow morning at Marlow, eleven o'clock. Steve sat nervously at the table and glanced at the menu. From now on, this evening out belongs to me. It was one o'clock when they got back home, but there was a surprising number of people about. There were two police cars in the mews, and an ambulance arrived as Paul was getting out of the car. The others seemed to be passers-by with nothing better to do at night than watch a girl lying dead on the pavement. Oh, God, Paul muttered. He's got Jenny. She was wearing the clothes she'd worn the previous night, and in the light from the street lamps her body could be seen twisted and smashed. The huge puddle of blood was black in the light. She looked, Paul thought bitterly, like a broken child's doll. Kate Balfour was talking to the police, telling them that she'd been with the girl all evening until at midnight she had popped home to fetch her sleeping things. I was only gone fifteen minutes. Paul knelt beside the girl and touched her cold face. She'd fallen the fifty feet from the guest room window. He glanced up. It was meant to look like suicide. Paul Temple leaned over the parapet and looked down into the murky water. It was a fine morning, and the sun was shining across the Thames. Paul gestured to the police launch below. A uniformed officer and two plainclothes men were ready. Paul glanced at his watch. Ten minutes to eleven. Paul wondered uneasily which direction the killer would come from. It would be unthinkable, he thought ironically, to be killed without ever knowing it. He walked to the south end of the bridge and stared down the road from Henley. Of course, the killer might have been waiting the past two hours in the hotel by the river. That would be the wisest place to ensure that no ambush was set up. Paul strolled back to the north side. A police car was parked in the private entrance to a boatyard a few yards downstream. Then the clock struck eleven. He'd never established whether Gladys had been stabbed in the back or whether the knife had been thrown by an expert at twenty yards. Paul braced his shoulders and turned round. The protection seemed an awful long way away. He felt rather conspicuous, alone on the bridge. A rover was coming along the road from Henley. When it reached the hotel, it turned off into the car park. Paul waited, and a few moments later Scott Reed emerged from it. He scurried towards the bridge like a nervous crab. The police had not moved. Suddenly he saw Paul on the bridge. His hand twitched involuntarily in the beginnings of a wave. Then he stopped. He glanced forwards and backwards before hurrying down the steps to the towpath. Scott! Paul shouted. Paul ran to the stairs and called down to the publisher. Scott, what the hell are you doing here? Scott came up the stairs as the four policemen converged on him from the nearby boathouse in the hotel. He smiled ingratiatingly. Oh, hello, Paul. I just came to see... You damned fool, Paul snapped. Don't you realize you've upset the whole operation? Temple, look out, someone shouted. Paul swung round in time to see a man racing towards him from the opposite side of the bridge. Two more policemen were pursuing Leo Ashwood in Paul's direction. Leo stopped and drew a gun from his pocket. He fired a couple of shots, one at Paul, the other at the police behind him. When Paul peered cautiously round the side of the stone stairs, a policeman was lying in a pool of blood, 
and Leo Ashwood was standing on the parapet. Nothing seemed to be happening. Leo, Paul called. Don't be silly. You're making things worse. I'll shoot. Leave me alone. You can't escape, so let's be sensible. I'll come and collect the gun from you, and then the police will look after you, he paused. All right, I'm coming out. Paul stepped onto the bridge. He walked slowly along the pavement towards the centre. He felt extraordinarily relaxed, interested to find himself behaving like this and coldly rational about the chance that Leo might shoot. He felt slightly sorry for Leo. The man was terrified and trapped. I'll shoot, Leo shouted. Don't think I won't kill you. You tricked me with that telephone call. Keep away, you bastard. You tricked me. Paul continued his walk towards him. He thought disinterestedly that Leo was talking in clichés. People under stress always fall back on clichés. Paul decided that if he lived to write his serious study of murder, he would have to remember that. No elegant dialogue during the death throes. Whilst he was thinking this, he was simultaneously aware of a car moving behind him. The fools, he thought to himself, they'll ruin everything. I'll shoot, Leo shouted, a pleading tone adding to his desperation. Don't think I won't. I'll shoot. The police car had roared onto the bridge and it screeched to a halt beside the shot policeman. Its four doors flew open and three uniformed officers sprang into the open. The fourth door had been opened by Charlie Vosper, but he didn't offer himself as a target. He waited until Leo had fired two more shots before emerging. Leo was as surprised at the explosion of the gun as the policeman whose arm was splintered by the bullet. He staggered sideways and lost his balance. Paul ran forward to grab his legs, but Leo was waving his arms about as he toppled from the bridge, while Paul tried to hang on to his ankle. Charlie Vosper grabbed the other leg, but Leo was too heavy. He fell with a scream into the river below. You're a bloody hero, aren't you? Vosper snarled. It would have worked, Paul said calmly. Leo was swimming against the current now, swimming towards the bank as the police launch roared into action. It swung out into the centre of the river and headed for the same spot on the bank. But Leo was clearly not a strong swimmer and his clothes were hindering him. He disappeared under the water once, then reappeared splashing and spluttering. The police launch changed course and made straight for him, but it was too late. Leo went under for a second time and failed to re-emerge. Steve, it's me, Paul shouted cheerfully. Hi, she waved over the balcony, then came down the staircase. You sound as if it went well. It didn't go too well. It's always bad when a man is dragged off by the currents and drowned, and a couple of policemen suffered minor injuries. The best we can say is that events have reached their conclusion. The pattern has been completed. He kissed her lightly on the top of the head. I'm always glad when a case is over, he admitted. I'll be able to do some writing now. Nothing but boredom for the next few weeks, I'm pleased to say. He sat down. Speaking of boredom, Scott Reed's invited us down to Hambledon for dinner tonight. Oh, no, said Steve. Do we have to? No, of course not. I told him we'd go out to that pub in Hindhead for supper. The restaurant behind the pub overlooked the Devil's Punch Bowl, a massive dip in the Sussex Downs lined with trees and bracken on every side. Paul felt they were dining on the edge of the world. You're not very good company, darling, Steve intruded into his thoughts. Eh, no, I'm sorry, I was thinking about the Kelby affair. He began talking about the case and explained the trap they'd set for Leo. I had to tell Scott what I was doing, he explained, because I needed the information about Kelby's will, and the stubborn devil refused to give it to me unless I took him into my confidence. Scott was smiling and sitting there with his slimly dignified wife, as if the world began and ended with the first editions of significant modern novels. Kelby was about to make a new will in favour of his son. I suppose Leo Ashwood knew that, said Steve. Precisely. He also knew that the current will was very much in his favour. Until Ronnie came home like a prodigal son, Leo stood to inherit nearly everything. So he must have been pretty furious, just waiting, in fact, for an opportunity such as Arthur Grover gave him. He could, Mrs. Reed suggested bloodthirstily, have simply bumped off Kelby in the night, any night. Perhaps he meant to, but when Grover telephoned during that evening, it was a marvellous opportunity.' 
Ronnie was out with Tracy Leonard, remember? They were searching for Kelby. So the moment Grover said he had information... Leo, Steve interrupted, pretended he was Ronnie Kelby. Right. He realised that his murder was ready and waiting to be committed. All Leo had to do was to go into the gardener's shed and strangle Alfred Kelby. Then he took the body across to Galloway Farm, in order to throw suspicion on Ted Mortimer. Yes, Paul continued. Ted Mortimer was a well-known enemy of nearly everybody in Milford Cross. Still is, I suppose, poor devil. They continued eating in silence. Paul was wondering whether he could have saved the life of Jenny Mortimer. I suppose, Steve said, that as soon as Arthur Grover rang up Melford House and said that he had some photographs of Leo disposing of the body, he knew who had taken the photographs. Jenny Mortimer's life wasn't worth living. You think so? Paul asked. He filled his glass with more wine. But, anyway, he knew there were no photos. He wished the tone of the conversation weren't so resolutely cheerful in its speculation. He wished they didn't expect him to be good company. They were casting accusing glances in his direction. And what about that shoe I was left with, Scott Reed asked insensitively. Did Leo used to inherit Kelby's old clothes? Well done, Scott. Paul genuinely laughed at the man's enthusiasm to know all the trivial details. And poor Gladys. She came to see me because she knew her husband was the killer. She must have guessed, Steve agreed, convinced of the power of feminine intuition. But how did you manage to get Ronnie out of the house so that Leo would take Grover's second phone call? That wasn't easy. But I caught Tracy Leonard in a Christian frame of mind, and I persuaded her to take Ronnie to the cinema. She hates the sight of Ronnie, and he's been making passes at her for weeks. I hope they won't blame me if they eventually marry and live unhappily ever after. Paul ordered another bottle of wine. It was a pleasantly euphoric evening, and after an hour or so the world became less real, and guilt lost its edge of pain. Paul began telling them about the sailor who was hanged beside the pub so many years ago. It was a gothic, mythic world beyond the window, a world of good and evil, a country scene where devils drank punch, and the night was filled with electrical storms. "'Send for the landlord,' said Paul. "'He'll know about the local folklore. "'Ask him to join us for a brandy.' Steve welcomed him with a smile. "'My husband is researching a book on gratuitous death,' she explained. "'It turned out that the landlord had a morbid frame of mind, too. "'Local legend has it it was a ritual murder. "'Some secret cult being practised down there in the clearing. "'He was a bluff military type, and the folklore would not disturb his sleep. "'Why was it never solved?' Paul asked him. Police were out of their depth. We had an exactly similar murder here last month, and they aren't making any progress with that. Exactly similar? Paul and the landlord became lost in conversation. Steve recognised only too clearly the eager interest her husband was showing. So much for the life of boredom they had been looking forward to. She wished they'd stayed at home that evening. Paul Temple and the Kelby Affair by Francis Durbridge was read by Anthony Head and is published by BBC Audiobooks. Books.